of the pulmonary hypertension complications or heart liver transplant complications really show up as people get older. Is um, is yeah. here? Sir, sir, sir is joining. We didn't. He's done in one, uh, just two minutes, sir. I think um, one of the thing is if I go back. I mean, it may look surprising in 1978 and 79, mm -hmm. Professor Jaffer was in Russia here. And sense. one of the medicine professors uh, said, uh, one of the professor of medicine said, why do we need cardiologists? Same thing happened to me when I went, I was exploring the option of opening EP in Bangladesh in 1999, uh, before that, I would go and talk to people and they would say, why do we need electrophysiologists? Now we take it for granted. And if you look in subspecialties, these fields are so complex. I was reading about Fontaine procedure survivors and how to follow them and let's see, it's amazing how complex these patients are. And it's very difficult for us. We are all, we know these things, but to be at the cutting edge, it becomes very, very difficult. And I think that's why it's very important to create specialists in each field in uh, each country. I mean, look at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy itself, amyloid cardiomyopathy. I mean, this, these are expanding so rapidly that you need to have somebody with special knowledge on that. So, and the way to do it is to send patients to that one person and create a specialist um, so that we can benefit from their knowledge uh, or his or her knowledge. Uh, Stacy, you agree with that? You have to unmute yourself, Stacy. Stacy, we can't hear you, unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I make any, what do you think of the specialization part question? Yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. So when I, when I first started in adult congenital, it was basically, well, you can work here as long as you see the general patients because that's who needs to be seen. Um, and you're welcome to have your subspecialty as well. And now, you know, I hear all the time, you have to stop seeing regular people because Nobody can see these very complex patients. Nobody wants to see these very complex patients. Um, and you really need to have the appointments and the time to take care of this growing population. So it's been a huge uh, change just in my time um, taking care of patients. And really developing the field has been a lot of fun. And there's a lot of very bright minds going into the field that should bring it forward. But these patients are surgically created patients that are survivors of pediatric heart disease uh, that require a lot of continued care. Um, and there, it's a very high level uh, interventional and surgical field. So it's a multidisciplinary experience that really needs to happen taking care of these patients. The, the best patient outcomes really happen with bridging programs with surgery uh, interventional cardiology, pediatric cardiology, and adult cardiology, putting all of the minds and technology together. Um, and that's how we really have this growing adult population. Yeah, thank you. So do, do you think we're almost ready to start? Ready, sir. Okay, let me, Tracy, let me introduce to Professor Adud. Um, uh, he joined just now. He is a professor of Medi cardiology plus chief of cardiology at Dhaka Medical College. Dhaka Medical College is the oldest medical school in Bangladesh. And he is an excellent teacher. And Jamil writes poetry, but Wadud recites poetry in his lectures. That's the beauty of it. I mean, he gives talks, it's amazing. I, I enjoy listening to his lectures, um, it's fantastic. Um, and what, the, what this group has done that, you know, all these physicians, their senior doctors very busy, but every Saturday we have been gathering for last one year and trying to educate the younger generation and they're giving their time um, just for the purpose of educating. Um, some of us are talking and others are staying there. I think by their presence, uh, I think it's an important thing that they are there. Um, Professor Ajam, Shafiq, Professor Moshin Hussain, who is the EP doctor, and, all of the faculty, um, Arun Maski, they come uh, join from Nepal and other faculty members and making this forum worthwhile. I think it's a beautiful program. I think we should get started. Um, um, 
Padud or whoever wants to start the program, please do. Let's, let's get going. Uh, Jisa, Ribu, start. Please start the uh, session. Okay, we are going live. Why? You can start now. Okay. Can we start? We are live. Yes, yes, we are live now. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, dear physicians. Today we have 33rd lecture on ECG basic and beyond. Today our topic is ECG in adult congenital heart disease, which is going to be delivered by Dr. Stacy Fisher, Associate Professor of Medicine, University of Maryland School of Medicine, Baltimore, USA. So uh, I request Professor Abdul Wadu Chaudhary, sir, to say some words regarding Dr. Stacy Fisher, and then we proceed further. Wadu, sir. Unmute, Unmute, please. Can't hear. Unmute. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Sir. Good evening, everybody. And thank you, everyone, for joining with us today. Today, we have a guest, Dr. Stacey Fisher. I think uh, uh, Dr. Tushar has already introduced her. Have you? I was a little uh, bit joining. No, sir. I have. Uh, I have. Uh, I have that have just introduction. I think you should introduce her to the audience. Actually, I don't have that by that with me. Can we do that? But okay, sir. I want uh, to... sir, Rofik sir has already initially uh, introduced uh, among the panelists. But what and... I want to say that today's topic is very interesting. Remember that many of the congenital heart disease patients used to die very early on. They're leaving off because they have corrective surgery or palliative surgery, but they are having another sort of problem. All sorts of arrhythmia, conduction defect, other problems. And some of the patients are living on with Eisenmenger syndrome. So there are changes in ECG. Those are progressive and coming on later on, added on with their preliminary primary ECG changes. And these things, we should be paying attention to. We have not have any specialist who is specializations on uh, adult congenital heart disease, but we should be uh, preparing ourselves, our next generation about that. We are quite lagging behind. In that regard, today's lecture will be very helpful for us. And we thank Rafik Saar for arranging such a lecture and introducing us to Dr. Stacy Fisher. Dr. Fisher, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. And I, uh, I tried to take this task that Dr. Ahmed gave me um, to look at EKG basic and beyond. And I wanted to give you an introduction to this patient group um, for the adult congenital heart patients and some of the struggles that they have from an EKG standpoint. I am hoping that this will be interactive. I hope that you'll speak up and uh, give opinions and thoughts. I tried to bring kind of an eclectic group and just a couple of congenital um, defects um, and some of the issues that happen. So I'm going to try to get to the next slide. So this is um, an office EKG uh, that showed up on a particular patient um, coming in as a new patient. Um, where our tech went in and put on the standard leads um, and came back with this tracing. I don't know if anybody has thoughts about this. This is a high level audience here. So this is, um, there's a, an unusual axis. There's Q waves in leads 1L, uh, essentially Q waves in V2 through V6. There's just no R wave progression across the podium. It's clearly a, a regular rhythm with an atrial rhythm, but it's an unusual P axis as well. If you look at the inverted P wave here in two. So this is the patient's chest x-ray. Um, and this is correctly displayed. Uh, and you can see the, the LV apex over in the right chest. So there's always a question of how do you do the EKG on a dextrocardia patient and what should be our standard in EKG on a dextrocardia patient. So what I showed you initially was standard leads. 
Um, recommended would be placing the V1 and V2 leads in the correct position across the, the chest, and then looking at the uh, right-sided chest leads, so putting them across the right-sided apex. And this is what you get if the V leads are on the right side of the chest. This shows you that there's dextrocardia using the arm leads in the correct position, but you see that now you have R waves that are normal across the precordium. Um, and if you do switch the right and left arms, you'll get what looks essentially to be the normal EKG or whatever the patient's EKG was going to be. I don't know why it went down too much. So again, if we start at the beginning, this would be your your correctly placed EKG on your standard patient. And then the V leads on the right side of the chest with the arm leads in standard position. And then if you reverse the arm leads uh, and have the V leads on the right side of the chest, that's how you have essentially a normal EKG. So this is the usual EKG for the dextrocardia patient where you would leave the arm leads alone and have the V leads on the right side of the chest. I don't know if there's thoughts, we can come back to that later as well. Um, thoughts about the position of the EKG for your dextrocardia patient. So there are some nuances in dextrocardia. First of all, dextrocardia is a congenital anomaly in which the normal position of the heart chambers is reversed, resulting in positioning of the heart so the ventricular apex is in the right hemithorax. Dextroversion would be abnormal position of the heart in the right hemithorax, but with the left ventricle anterior. And dextroposition means that you have a normally uh, arranged heart, a normal left-sided apex with rightward displacement due to the underlying pulmonary pleural or diaphragmatic abnormalities. So the position of the heart is pushed over to the right, but the heart orientation is normal. So the incidence of dextrocardia, it's one of the earliest known congenital abnormalities first described in 1643. It's autosomal recessive inheritance. Overall incidence of one in 10,000 live births. Uh, one in 5,000 will have dextrocardia with situs inversus. One in 20,000 have dextrocardia with normal situs. Equal male and female predominance and 50% of dextrocardia patients will have associated cardiac defects. So this is a different type of patient. Again, a routine office EKG for congenital heart patients. Any thoughts about what this particular patient might have? I'm calling out to get you guys involved here. Hmm? You want to bring any of the young faculty, uh, young doctors or somebody to participate? Yes, I do. RSR pattern is here in B1, B2, and B3. Yeah, so definitely RVH, maybe RVH with the strain pattern. Okay. And again, an unusual axis. Axis is it right as... Yes. So, so this um, is consistent with a systemic right ventricle or systemic right ventricular pressure at least, right? With the degree of RVH present. So this is actually a, a detransposition of the great vessel patient. Yes. So you have a systemic right ventricle and you have an axis that is uh, far rightward and the strain pattern with um, ST, slight ST depression and deep T wave inversion. And again, this is a normal sinus mechanism. So if we look at a different patient who's a DTGA status postmaster, the first patient I showed you really has, uh, is a little bit younger, also has a nice narrow complex um, and it has a strain pattern, but not like this patient has. So this is a patient with, um, uh, with uh, less right ventricular function, uh, worsening function, um, more dilated, uh, wider QRS complex. And you can see that there are ectopic beats. So likely 
likely APCs with aberration here. Unless anybody wants to make an argument that these are PVCs. Um, but this patient uh, started to have a lot of atrial arrhythmias, um, progressive heart failure. And this patient actually underwent heart transplant. This patient also had a large VSD and higher pulmonary pressures. And after transplant, this is the patient's EKG. So this is no longer a systemic right ventricle. This is a post-transplant EKG. Um, patient developed a right bundle branch block in the transplant heart. Uh, definitely more of a typical right bundle, left anterior hemi block. Kind of interesting where most of our post-transplant EKGs have normal, normal electrical activity. This is another DTGA patient. Uh, this patient was developing exercise intolerance. And as you can see, there's a very significant degree of RVH. And again, a strain pattern, the complexes sometimes get very wide. Usually the, the sinus node is the predominant node for atrial rhythm. Um, as you can see, there's also uh, a rotation of the heart. You could call it a lateral infarct pattern, but again, it's a systemic right ventricle with a rotated heart. And this is the patient uh, exercising. So these exercise EKGs can be difficult because of the wide nature of the complex. Um, but as you saw in the baseline complex where you know we do have uh, P waves before every QRS, and the heart rate um, started going up normally. So complications of detransposition can include um, a narrow baffle. Uh, these patients, just to look at the anatomy a little bit, I'm gonna come back here in a second. Um, detransposition means that the vessels are transposed. So you would have the right atrium to the right ventricle to the aorta, and in this, condition, the issue is that without a shunt like a VSD, ASD, or PDA, um, there isn't any communication between the venous and the arterial blood flow. So you have to do something to either switch the vessels or switch the atria. Until 1975 in Brazil and 1982 in the U.S., um, there were no arterial switches. Uh, so what they did is they switched the atria. And I'll show you a little bit better the baffle switches that were done, the mustard or the sending procedures. Um, and that led to a lot of folding of the atrial tissue, a lot of distortion of the atrial tissue, and then a lot of subsequent atrial arrhythmias. Um, so one third to one half of the patients showed decreased systemic RV function 15 to 18 years post repair. Um, systemic AV valve regurgitation also um, occurs frequently and baffle issues are not uncommon. Sinus node dysfunction is very common and there is a very high pacing requirement in this group. So if we go back to, to this particular patient, um, this patient has a pacemaker lead that goes through this baffle. So what happens is they have uh, folded in this um, mustard patient, the venous, flow into the LV, which goes out to the pulmonary artery. So then blood flow comes back into the, in the pulmonary veins through a, um, basically a septostomy into the right atrium to the right ventricle to the aorta. So you can see on the CT pulmonary veins going into the left atrium through the open septum to the right atrium into the RV and then out to the body. So this is a nice widely patent baffle where this is a very narrow one centimeter baffle that has stenosed around this pacemaker wire that goes into the venous LV. So this is a complication that occurs with this patient. Uh, what we ended up doing actually was stenting over the uh, pacemaker wire, pinning it, um, and then subsequently putting a new ICD wire into the venous LV.
So um, in these patients, uh, they frequently present with palpitations, presyncope and syncope. Um, both brady and tachyarrhythmias are frequently seen. 50% over time develop sinus node dysfunction uh, rel relative to physical damage during surgery and baffle construction. Um, there's also disruption of the blood supply leading to ischemia, blood supply to the sinus node. 20% develop a flutter. These patients are very sensitive to nodal agents in general due to conduction system disease. 11% um, required pacemakers at 20 years. Um, the sinus node can actually be uh, injured during the atrial surgery. Often these patients have a junctional rhythm um, at presentation. Um, resting, resting bradycardia is usually well tolerated, um, but they can develop progressive chronotropic competence. Um, so this is uh, another one of the mustard patients who presented just not feeling quite well, and this was their EKG. So as you can see, they have the RVH uh, with strain pattern and a rotated axis here, and a flutter pattern. And I would make the argument this is a little bit of an atypical flutter pattern. It's not a perfect uh, sinus wave. It's not perfectly at 300, degree, 300 uh, beats per minute. There's variable conduction and uh, PVC is present. This is uh, a mustard patient who had a different patient who is a DTGA VSD and had a holter for palpitations. And here you can see that uh, this patient was having frequent APCs throughout the holter monitor. Um, you can see a little bit of the morphology of the PAC here. And then this patient had um, SVT runs that were correlating with uh, symptoms. Um, as fast as 191 beats per minute. Uh, this patient was placed on DIGH and has been doing well on digoxin actually. Um, so what about congestive heart failure in these patients? Most adult patients do develop congestive heart failure. Uh, most of, by age 20 are New York Heart Association class one or two. Um, as they get older, that can change. Usually in the 40s and 50s, uh, most of the patients are having difficulty. Um, our RV filling is compromised due to defects in baffle construction. Uh, there can be baffle leaks with shunting. There can be baffle obstruction like the one that I showed you. Um, and it can manifest as SVC syndrome or hepatic congestion and cirrhosis due to the IVC um, baffle stenosing. It can be undetected because of collateral venous drainage. I'd highly recommend if you're putting a device in one of these patients that you do a CT or imaging ahead of time to make sure that your baffles are open and that you understand the dimensions of the baffles. 40% um, develop right ventricular dysfunction 10 to 40% develop two plus or greater tricuspid regurgitation, which is your systemic AV valve. If you have a normally formed valve, the AV valve regurgitation is a symptom of the failing ventricle. And that's actually really important to follow and to use as a marker of how the patient's really doing. Um, they get annular dilation from the right ventricular dilation and failure. They can also have had damage from surgery or endocarditis. So this is just an echo image showing the thickness of the systemic RV and the um, interventricular dependence where the septum is going toward the LV, both in systole and diastole, which obviously you can't see here, um, but that shows you the high volume and pressure of the systemic right ventricle. So another Another variation of this is levotransposition of the great vessels, a congenitally corrected TGA or LTGA. And in this condition, it's really the ventricles that are switched. So if you have, um, if you take your normal heart and just switch the ventricles, you have a circuit that works. Um, 
you're not dependent on switching the atrium or switching the vessels for the circuit to work. You would only try to do that if you needed the LV to be the systemic LV. So here's a good example of that where you have a very anterior aorta um, coming off of your RV. So the, the ventricle is actually switched. Um, and you can see that your aorta and PA are parallel at the takeoff. So you can see all six, um, all six cusps. So three on the PA, three on the aorta, and they're parallel side by side here. Uh, and this is a good example of, the, of a device sitting in the LV where you have this big systemic RV. And the LV is anterior because again, the, best, the ventricles are reversed, highly associated with BSD. You may have a similar EKG to what you see in DTGA, um, but usually you do have a narrower QRS complex. Again, you can see the massive uh, voltage in V1, V2 showing RVH and the strain pattern. Um, and again, you have a rotated axis. So this um, LTGA patient, uh, is a, this is an exercise test. He was having mild exercise intolerance. He would hike, he could walk miles. He was in his 20s um, and he just would hit a brick wall when he's exercising. So he would do his regular Hello? hiking, get to the same point. Hello? Is everything okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's okay, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, so the patient was doing his same hike and would just run out of steam. So we put him on the treadmill and uh, he started having ectopy pretty early in the course of exercise. So uh, started having uh, sinus rhythm, um, frequent PVCs. And then here, it looked like he dropped a beat. So this is his atrial rate as he's exercising. Um, and post PVC, he would drop a beat. And as he continued to exercise, he started dropping beats more regularly and he had two to one AV block. So he got up to about a heart rate of 80, 85. And then he started blocking two to one, became symptomatic at this level. So this was his peak exercise. And you can see there's a change in his uh, conduction here. And this is his recovery tracing. So this is an LTGA patient and this patient did get a pacemaker. So you can see the interesting leads in the pacemaker. So the atrial wire look, um, just a little bit rotated, but fairly stable. And this wire is going into the venous LV, which you can see nicely on the uh, lateral. So this is his stress test the next year, PACE. Um, and again, he's being paced through his, uh, through his LV. So you're seeing a different morphology of pacing than you would normally see. And I show this just because again, with the wide complex with these patients, we really need to go back and look at their baseline EKG because this is sinus tack during exercise. Sinus tack with V pacing with a dual chamber pacemaker. So the incidence of LTGA is 0.5% of congenital heart disease, slightly male predominant. Um, complete heart block, 5 to 10% at birth, 10 to 15% in adolescence, 30% in adult. First or second degree AV block, 40 to 50% at birth. 40% retain normal PR intervals and QRS through their lives. Um, the ventricular function is not truly normal, but sufficiently good in most. Tendency to deteriorate in the second or third decade of life. Um, frequently, there are coexisting cardiac abnormalities like VSD, PS, uh, left AV valve incompetence, which is the tricuspid. It is 1% uh, per year cumulative that these patients will go on to need a pacemaker for heart block or chronotropic incompetence. 
most of these patients, unless they have concomitant disease, have not had any surgery. So these are not surgical issues. This is really because the conduction system is so superficial uh, that it's injured e easily in normal hemodynamic states. So uh, this patient, I think, puts it all together. This is a tough EKG and tracing. Um, this is a patient that uh, has uh, some respiratory issues, um, kind of uh, didn't feel well. She actually had SVT and shock um, presented for assessment. And with the complex um, problems that we've discussed, this puts it all together. So this is a good example of her tracing with regular leads. So she is a dextrocardia patient with this type of access and for our wave progression, but she also has a widened QRS. And when you put the leads on the correct side of her chest, um, you actually see a big change in that she does have our wave progression uh, she still has a hemi block, left anterior hemi block, kind of a borderline first degree block. So this is an LTGA dextrocardia patient. I had to do that. <laughs> um, and this is a good example of where her venous LV is sitting. Um, and we have some patients whose heart is really up in here. Uh, and again, you'll get a different morphology of the EKG. Um, so also just for, for boards and for general thoughts, if you have a patient like this, LTGA with dextrocardia with situs inversus, think of uh, keratagonal syndrome, which is primary ciliary dyskinesia. And a lot of these patients also have a lot of respiratory or intestinal issues. So treatments for transposition, especially DTGA would be the arterial switch operations, mustard or sending atrial switch operations. Um, you do have to worry that the coronaries have been translocated, uh, that you can have coronary disease and sudden death related to that. Sometimes they've had a VSD repair where they can get ventricular arrhythmias, and sometimes they have to be taken into a single ventricle path. Um, possible complications include baffle obstruction. So again, if you're looking at doing an EP study or device on one of these patients, you always want to look at the venous return and the, um, the size of the baffles, make sure they're not getting obstructed. Uh, atrial arrhythmias and sinus node dysfunction are very frequent. Um, baffle leak, uh, basically, um, and any hole between uh, the, the Systemic and venous circulations can occur where the surgeries have been. Um, for the arterial switch, we always worry about coronary insufficiency, uh, supervalvular AS or PS because of the anastomotic sites, or branch pulmonary artery obstruction. Uh, historically, it's really important to know where these patients have been, how old they are, what age they were when they had surgery, where they were in the world. Um, for example, the first successful surgery for a tetralogy of hello patient was 1955. Um, for the uh, arterial switch in TGA with BSD was 1975. And for hypoplastic left heart and Norwood reconstruction in 1983. So patients that are older than that have had some type of palliation that may historically have been tried or present, uh, but it wouldn't be exactly these procedures. So give me an example of a real ACHD patient, uh, one that has arrhythmias for this group, of course. So this is a woman who's in her 60s now. She's a tetralogy of Fallot patient. She had a right modified BT shunt at age five at Johns Hopkins University, so no surgery until age five. Um, her non-transannular patch with BSD repair and infundibulectomy was done at Hopkins at age eight. Um, she had complete AV block with syncope and uh, LV dysfunction at a biventricular pacemaker placed in 2014. She has been plagued by SVTs, especially atrial flutter, and she's had several ablations. Um, she uh, had um, pulmonary valve insufficiency in a dilated right ventricle, um, moderate to severe RV dilation. 
she had a percutaneous pulmonary valve placed in the native right ventricular outflow tract in June 2016. This was actually our first TET with a native pulmonary valve catheter placed. Um, she has a mild coronary disease um, and a supracommissural origin of uh, one of her coronaries. Uh, many of the TET patients have coronary anomalies, so that's really important to know as well. And she's had right pulmonary artery stenosis. So this is an example of her last calf um, when she got her pulmonary valve in 2016. Uh, she went from an RV EDP of 16 uh, to much lower after the valve was placed. She does not have pulmonary hypertension. Many people look at um, this RV pressure 42 over four and think of pulmonary hypertension, but her pulmonary mean pressure um, actually, her pulmonary pressure is a little bit higher. Her mean pressure was 24. Most of our patients actually don't have a lot of pulmonary hypertension. This patient, after dilation of her, her pulmonary stenosis, her right pulmonary stenosis also had uh, improved main pulmonary pressure. So this is an example. Um, but this is the concern. So these patients have a risk of sudden cardiac death from VT, mainly from the ventriculotomy sites from where the patch uh, has been, but also from LV dysfunction and scarring from multiple surgeries and multiple procedures, hypoxic events. So she actually presented in VT um, ill. Uh, if you look at the morphology of this VT, it's monomorphic. Um, probably coming from the outflow tract where her patch is. So she's still been plagued by shortness of breath and arrhythmia. As you can tell, she also had spinal issues and has a, has a rod. Um, her ICD is actually placed on the right because of her coronary anatomy. This is her percutaneously placed dented pulmonary valve. So you can see where her pulmonary outflow tract is, which lets you know how big her RV really is here. So this is her atrial lead, her ventricular lead in the RV, and her RV is all here. This is her pulmonary outflow tract. Um, her basic EKG, uh, she's got frequent PVCs. Um, here she has atrial fib and V pacing. So she started amiodarone. She had had some toxicity on amiodarone therapy with hyperthyroidism. She started dofetilide. It, she improved in the hospital, was discharged. Two weeks after she went home on dofetilide, she came in with 10 shocks um, with this rhythm. So this is the same patient with torsade. Uh, this was stopped. Her ICD was programmed to a, a heart rate, a pacing heart rate of 90. She had high dose magnesium. She was restarted on bistolic, which she had been on, but at a much higher dose. Uh, she had asthma with metoprolol. So she went back to the lab um, because she was on Tegacin for her atrial arrhythmias, which were limiting to her. And she was found to have developed a channel. Uh, and this is, uh, Glenn Meininger shared this with me, who did her EP study. Um, so she had developed a channel of, uh, of scar tissue between the surgical site and her, um, and her trigone. And he ablated all through here, trying to stop her atrial flutter so that she could be off of all of the antiarrhythmic. Um, however, she continued to have frequent PVCs and uh, she still had monomorphic VT. She underwent a subsequent VT study um, and ablation. Um, and uh, is doing better on high dose bistolic at this point. This is a different patient. I just wanted to take you through a couple um, tetralogy of flow EKGs on a few different patients so you can see some of the uh, different dynamics of their EKGs. Uh, a lot of the younger patients who've had pulmonary valve sparing procedures have a more narrow or even narrow QRS. 
that anybody who's had a transannular patch will have a right bundle branch block. One of the most important things about them is the duration of their right bundle. Uh, anybody with a duration more than 180 is gonna be prone as the first patient I showed you was uh, to ventricular rhythms. So this patient has a cure restoration of 136 milliseconds, notably having PVCs. Uh, this is a 30 year old patient postpartum. Uh, this is another patient who has a little bit wider QRS duration. You can see it's usually a typical right bundle branch block. Um, and this is uh, our patient that I just showed you who is now AV paced with frequent PVCs, still with a very wide QRS complex. And that's one of the big differences between somebody who was repaired as a neonate and had maybe a pulmonary valve sparing procedure and somebody who had their surgery at five to 16 years of age, which is what a lot of our adult patients have that have um, underlying pulmonary uh, venous disease and also um, significant RV failure. So uh, um, Dr. Uh, Chiari actually um, published a really nice journal, a really nice circulation article that looks at what are the predictors of sudden cardiac death or appropriate ICD shocks in tetralogy of below patients. Um, and the, the variables that mattered are different than variables in other types of disease, such as coronary disease, where prior palliative shunt, um, so anybody who's had a shunt uh, certainly has a higher risk. Anybody who has an ICD, has EP study that, um, that is inducible certainly has a higher risk. The QRS duration, every one millisecond increases the risk, but anybody with a QRS above 180 milliseconds, it's much more risk. Ventriculotomy incisions, so your older patients are gonna have higher risk. Uh, anyone with non-sustained VT on monitoring, so monitoring is incredibly important to look for this risk factor. Um, RVSP, as it increases, the risk goes up. So mean pulmonary artery pressure uh, that's elevated is higher risk. LVEDP uh, above 12, um, which is not that high of an LVEDP, is a huge hazard ratio for risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, and the biggest ones are LVEDP that is high and non-sustained VT or syncope. So uh, conclusions, congenital heart patients vary historically um, uh, by available surgeries and what type of palliation they might've had available and might've had access to. The access can help you understand cardiac position. Use the QRF duration and atrial arrhythmias to understand the arrhythmia risk. Um, and uh, again, these patients uh, really are truly the Keystone of personalized medicine, um, and the EKG is going to take you far in understanding what they have and how to take care of them. So I was hoping for some discussion. Thanks, Tracy, um, for a wonderful lecture. I mean, this this shows that uh, this field is so complex. Uh, I'd like uh, Brigadier General Fatima Nurna to make some comments and. Uh, because thank you. you are, yeah. Thank you, for giving me the chance to say a few words. Uh, I just want to say that in the United States of America, in every year, 20,000 people, children with congenital heart diseases are adding to the adolescent or adult population. Nowadays, there are fantastic treatment opportunities for the fetus, for the newborn for the infants, children, and adolescents. And all of them are now entering into the adulthood. And in future, community of congenital heart disease will be less than that of the community with adult congenital heart disease. Because, because of the in, improvement in the treatment facility and the availability of the ECMO, nitric oxide, and many other things, the outcome of the surgery either palliative or definitive is very good. And all of these children, they are entering into the adulthood with 
some of the problems like problems of arrhythmia, problems of heart failure, problems of pulmonary hypertension, problems of residual shunt, or problems with the surgery which was performed. So these are the problems which are uh, with the adult congenital population. Now, I just want to mention that uh, we know that sinoid, sinoidal node is the node where uh, the uh, actually heartbeat is originated, and then it traveled into the atrioventricular node. Now, there is some relation of congenital heart diseases with the male position of these nodes. For example, sinoatrial node is displaced in case of situs inversus, what was shown in Stasis first slide, and also in the juxtaposition of the appendages. You know that there is a condition where both the appendages remain on the same side of the pedicle. And in left, uh, left juxtaposition, sometimes there is no sinus node or sinus node is displaced. So there is some problem. And in another condition, where there is, is the situs inverse, as I have mentioned. So these two conditions, and also heterotaxy syndrome, we know that there is, uh, there is possibility of right isomerism or left isomerism in case of heterotaxy syndrome. And if there is right isomerism, there is no problem. But in case of left isomerism, where, is, where there is two left atrium, sinus node may be absent or may be displaced in a position that ECG become abnormal. So these are the abnormalities of the sinus node associated with the congenital heart disease. Again, there is displacement of the atrioventricular node and bundle of his with some of the diseases like AV canal defect. We know that there is endocardial cushion defect. So AB node is displaced inferiorly and anteriorly again in the tricuspid atresia and also in the single ventricle, uh, AB node lost its position and it is displaced inferiorly, anteriorly, posteriorly. So in various directions, there is displacement. So in those cases, we find some kind of abnormalities. And coming to the specific disease, which Stacy has mentioned already, but I just want to mention that in our experience, we deal with a lot of ACSD. In our ACSD clinic, we have treated congenital heart disease of the uh, childhood period and also sudden uh, incidental finding of the ACHD itself in adult population. Among them, atrial septal defect is very common. In every cath lab day, I did, I do usually like one or two ASD cases in adult and sometimes like some other cases also in the adult. Uh, and those are like patent ductus arteriosus, ventricular septal defect, but some less important disease like bicuspid aortic valve like mitral valve prolapse, these are also very common in adult population, along with like mild aortic stenosis, mild. And then like transposition of great arteries. Sometimes the corrected transposition of great arteries, if it is not associated to the ventricular septal defect, not associated to the pulmonary stenosis, these diseases remain undetected unless this patient develop right ventricular failure because right ventricle is the systemic ventricle in corrected transposition. So in course of time, right ventricle fail. So the, uh, the disease come into the notice. Otherwise, this disease is identified in post-mortem examination in most of the cases. So these are some of the diseases and most common problem with the treated congenital heart disease, for example, Fontan operation. Fontan operation is a kind of operation uh, which is performed in single ventricle condition to separate the pulmonary circulation from the systemic circulation. And this pulmonary circulation uh, actually bypasses the ventricle. So directly blood enters from the superior and inferior vena cava into the pulmonary artery without any assistance of the pumping action of the ventricle. So in that condition, there are so many problems in later age like protein losing enteropathy, there is evidence of chylothorax, thromboembolic manifestations, and many other things, uh, even pulmonary hypertension. And if pulmonary pressure raises only two millimeter marker even, then there is chance of failure of the fontan circulation because there is no help of the ventricular pump. 
and SBC and IBC has to empty themselves into the pulmonary artery only by their own pressure gradient. So if there is any rise of pressure in the pulmonary artery, there is chance of failure of the fontan. So there may be superior vena cabal syndrome. There may be inferior vena cabal syndrome. And with this, there are sick sinus syndrome uh, and some other kind of arrhythmias also. So uh, again, there are in some patients, we find the coarctation of the aorta as an incidental finding. So when we find someone with hypertension, we look for the cause. Is there any secondary cause of the hypertension? Then we find that there is coarctation of the aorta. Even I have seen some cases of abdominal coarctation of aorta. Some of the cases of Takayasu disease, I have seen in the adult with multiple coarctation. So these are the conditions which are very common, uh, Rafiq Bhai, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, Stacy, can you ask you a question? Stacy? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when a patient come to me, for example, a patient having a palliative operation of tet uh, fellow, uh, tetralogy of fellow, if the patient present ECG shows the QRS is widening or the axis is changing, does that mean the patient is going to have future chance of developing complete heart block or arrhythmias, supraventricular arrhythmias particularly? Um, I missed what type of patient. Uh, a tetralogy yeah. fellow, for example, uh, who had a palliative operation, not corrective surgery, but now the ECG is showing a more, a previously the ECG was not that wide, QRS complex. Now it is becoming wide-ish. Does it indicate future uh, heart block or future supraventricular arrhythmias? That's a great question. So in Tetralogy of Fallot is really the only place that they have shown an increase of risk of sudden death specific to the width of the QRS. But for most of the patients, you know, if the QRS word widens, I always worry about the ventricular function because it takes so much longer for the electrical circuit to get across the dilated muscle. Um, so that's, you know, that's something I would look for. Uh, but certainly these patients, because they've had significant ventriculotomies, atriotomies, and a lot of scar along these multiple incisions, they're all at risk for atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias, depending on what was done. That's why it's so important to understand historically what was done and where it was done. If you can get the original op notes, which sometimes we can and sometimes we can't, then you actually know where the incisions are and, and it does help to stratify their risk. Um, if they're having things like near syncope or syncope, I would always consider the EP study um, to, to look for uh, why, because again, their risk is so high you know, maybe 20 to 40% in these complex patients that they actually have predisposition toward ventricular arrhythmias. Nahruma, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. <coughs> and we are doing uh, some congenital surgery that you have shown that staining mustard uh, arterial switch and Fontan and BD Glane operation. And uh, this type of patient with complication are coming to us. And uh, we are, uh, means we are struggling with this type of patient. Just I want to uh, ask you a question that uh, uh, recently we have a patient, adult patient who have undergone Fontan operation and then he developed complete heart block. So we know that in Fontan operation, SBC is connected with RPA and IVC is connected with RPA and there is no fenestration. Surgeon has not kept any fenestration to the uh, conduit to RA. So on that case, how uh, you will uh, do a pacemaker on that case? This is uh, one question. Another question is uh, sometimes there is adult congenital heart disease where RV is rudimentary. Some cases like DILV or AV discordance where RV is rudimentary. On that time also there is complete heart block so how you manage this type of patient? So those are, those are the toughest of the tough patients and it does depend on their anatomy. Most of the, if you need ventricular pacing, it almost definitely has to be epicardial. Um, 
again, when you put, uh, there have been some people that have put uh, systemic pacers in, but with anticoagulation, but there's a stroke risk with that. Um, there also have been people that have put in pacemakers, it's for just atrial pacing in the lateral tunnel, so that it's sitting right next to the atrium for, an, for a lateral tunnel fontan. So it depends on the type of fontan procedure, um, but you can get a lot of chylus injury with that. So in general, most of these patients need epicardial pacing, which requires another sternotomy, which certainly has risk when they have all of the collaterals that they have with their chest wall. Um, so pacing can be very difficult. A lot of times when the fontan is done, if there's any already known predisposition to a heart block, then, um, then actually putting the uh, patches on uh, prophylactically during the initial sternotomy is smart. And then you can always go back and hook it up to a device. Um, but, uh, but again, it's going to be very individual based on their anatomy. I am definitely not a fan of any systemic lead. And all of these patients have so many AV collaterals that they, you know, I would certainly consider them having somewhat systemic circulation um, and have a low predisposition to anticoagulating them for any lead. Okay, ma'am, and that DILV cases where RV is small on that cases? So if it's a, if it's a dual chamber repair um, and you need, if, so is it a, it's a single ventricle repair? Yes. Yeah, then, then you're going to repair it as a single ventricle so that that accessory ventricle or hypoplastic ventricle is just part of the other ventricle. You have to consider that a single ventricle. You can't put a wire in there. It's a systemic position. Am I, I understanding the question or no? Uh, <laughs> I was asking that RV is rudimentary. So uh, how you will place the uh, ventricular lead or in fountain where we are cannot enter into the ventricle if there is no fenestration. You tell that sternotomy and then we will do the epicardial pacing. Uh, I want to clear it that I, I didn't get your point. Oh, so even, even if there is a fenestration and you can get in, you wouldn't want to leave a, leave a systemic lead in there. You could do an EP study that way, but you wouldn't want to leave anything. EP study because the IVC and RVC, uh, SVC is connected with a conduit. Now uh, we, I have no entry to RA and RV. So how will, uh, I will get there? Right, so you mean to do an EP study? You yes. can only do it if it's fenestrated or if you make a fenestration. Okay, if there is no fenestration. Or you can, or you can go retrograde, right? You can go re retrograde through the aorta. Okay. Thank you. But you're not gonna leave something in there that, you know, that would be a systemic wire. Dr. Stacy. There have been a couple of cases where people have done that, but the stroke risk is high. Um, I mean, and again, I've seen two people that have had um, leads put into their lateral tunnel just for atrial only pacing and left there. But uh, one of them had pretty bad um, pilus injury and had a lymphatic injury and had recurrent effusions uh, for years after that. Um, and once you have that, removing the lead doesn't solve the problem. So I don't, I don't think it's worth doing it in the first place. I think the risk is too high. A lot of these patients, Tracy, end up with epicardial lead um, because there is no access. And as you mentioned, if you put it in the right left ventricle, the risk of stroke uh, is, is a problem. So, uh, in PEL TGA, uh, TGA uh, let's say the problem uh, can be either conduction defect or aggressive uh, systemic ventricle dysfunction. And in that case, uh, if you want to do a bifid pacing, how do you do it? Can it be done with the normal way? Uh, no, it can't, it can't be done in a normal way in a single ventricle physiology because you have separated the circulations. Um, you can, the only way to do it would be epicardial. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, and also for the pacing. So you're going to need the, the epicardial leads on both sides. Usually the problem with the single ventricle fund hand patients is not even so much just the heart, it's the passive flow and the bystander organ dysfunction. So a lot of times it's really the liver that makes you do something about the heart. Uh, can we do something pharmacologically before the patient develop progressive artery dysfunction? Will the RNA and beta blocker helps in preventing progression of the dysfunction? in this atrial congenital heart disease? Where are so in, something like that? So in specifically the, well, there are not good studies of ERNI in the Fontan patients. And again, the Fontan circuit, usually it's the passive flow and the liver dysfunction that is the main problem, unless you have valvular disease, uh, especially for hypoplastic um, right heart. For hypoplastic left heart, you do end up getting RV dysfunction. For people like um, the mustard and senning population, many times you actually have responders or even there's a subclass of super responders to the ARNI therapies where they really do get much stronger effect and these new medications are helping. They've never really shown benefit of just ACE inhibitors or ARB, certainly of beta blockers for arrhythmias. Um, spironolactone as it helps the right heart seems to be a really, really good drug in many of these patients that have systemic right ventricles. But I think it has to be more specific to the um, actual anatomy and problem. Um, and just following traditional heart failure guidelines doesn't always work. Yeah. But we always start that way. And again, the, the hypoplasts are, are harder. The Fontan physiology is harder because again, what you have is passive flow. So you don't have pulmonary hypertension, but if you get any uh, diastolic dysfunction from the single ventricle or volume loading from the single ventricle, you raise the pulmonary venous pressure enough that, uh, that you don't get enough forward flow and you reduce the cardiac index. And then you get a lot of venous disease. So varicosities, clots, uh, sluggish flow, low cardiac index because of low filling. So there is a lot of study using um, pulmonary vasodilators to improve the forward flow. So sildenafil um, and others. Uh, I wonder, uh, many of the time uh, we find that patient had an AST uh, operated or a device closure done, but the uh, there is progressive increase in the pulmonary pressure and patient is actually having severe pulmonary hypertension. And in these cases, uh, what sort of arrhythmia you will expect more and what can we do to prevent those arrhythmias? So um, first of all, for any ASC closure, it's really important to make sure that the pulmonary vascular resistance is reasonable before closing it because you can really have right heart failure when you close it otherwise. Um, you know, we've even had a couple of people that have had PFOs closed when the problem is really pulmonary hypertension and the PFO is more of a pop-off um, and they have a lot of trouble. And sometimes you, you know, sometimes you actually have to refenestrate that. Um, as far as ASD closures, you know, um, below age 24 to close the ASD, you usually get back to normal rhythm risk. And the, in the, the lifetime curves above age 24, the risk of AFib remains elevated even after you close it. Um, so that the risk of AFib is really the biggest risk after ASD closure specifically because of the dilated size of the atrium, it doesn't usually go back to normal. And that's more related to the atrial stretch and size than the pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Stacy, I just want to ask you about some of the coronary abnormalities in congenital heart disease. You know that there are some patients who are having alkapa, like anomalous left coronary artery origin from the pulmonary artery. And also sometimes there are coronary cameral fistula or coronary fistula. So uh, what is the incidence of that in your center? And 
what is the common ECG findings in those cases? Yeah, so L-kappa uh, is one specific um, uh, anomalous coronary from the left pulmonary artery. That, that is more common in childhood. It usually presents with severe cardiomyopathy in childhood. So we've had a couple of patients that have had previous repairs that, um, that uh, have regrown collaterals where the repair was and have uh, start having basically a steel syndrome. So usually patients who've had coronary anomaly surgeries in childhood will continue to do surveillance and stress testing, looking for recurrent problems, stenosis, or even development of atherosclerotic disease at the anastomotic sites. Um, many congenital heart conditions have associated coronary anomalies, specifically uh, LTGA can have that. Um, and also you can have, um, and you can have sudden death in LTGA patients as they get older related. Many tetralogy patients have anomalous coronaries. And the one we always worry about is one that courses over the uh, septum of the LV so that when they go in to replace the pulmonary valve, they can ligate the coronary crossing. So it's usually an LAD that's aberrant that can cross over the septum um, and it would happen right in the surgical field. So I'd highly recommend a cath before any um, tetralogy surgery. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, what is the incidence of long QT syndrome and Brugada syndrome in your uh, places? And what are the treatment, preventive treatment for them? So, so long QT syndrome and Brugada syndrome, I, I run a um, cardiogenetics program. So I think our incidence would be higher than the general incidence because we specifically see families that have sudden cardiac death and do the gene testing. Um, routinely. Um, so we do see those patients. Uh, again, there's criteria well established for when they might need an ICD um, versus whether they need beta blockers versus whether they need surveillance. And depending on their family history, their genetic findings and their EKG and symptoms, uh, we would decide about whether or not they need activity restrictions. But I think those are the main considerations are do they need activity restrictions, beta blockers, um, or uh, and or ICD? Yeah. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I have a question for you. Okay. Do you do procedures? Uh, no. I well, okay. TEE advanced okay. echo and, and emergency. That, that is a no. Yeah, there is a specific reason that I'm asking this question, and I will explain to our audience in Bangladesh. Stacy Fisher does congenital heart disease. In the United States, we have non-invasive cardiology. I'm going to give an analogy of US Air Force. When US Air Force flies the bombers, especially nuclear bombers, there are navigators who doesn't know how to fly a plane at all. And there are pilots. And those pilots are below the, they are not below the rank of left hand corner because this stretch is a strategic bomber. Why I'm bringing up this issue that navigator tells the pilot when to drop the bomb, where to drop the bomb. And that's where comes the role of non invasive cardiologist. In a busy world, I do EP, interventional guide doing procedures, they don't have time to read the nitty gritty and make a detailed planning. And that is the future that Bangladesh will have to look at. First of all, the population of Bangladesh is half of United States. So that means we have half the number of any disease that we see in the United States. So there's a huge number of patients to take care of in pediatric cardiology. And as time progresses, we have to really come up with a clear group of doctors doing procedures and doing um, uh, making plans detailed planning, following this patient, and then telling me as an EP what to do. Uh, Stacy will send me a patient with congenital heart disease. He said, by the way, this is the anatomy, and this is what you need to do, because these are all individualized care, right, Stacy? Each patient is different, and it is so important. So I think we need to, we are, 
Bangladesh is heading in the direction we need to um, look into the model of non-invasive cardiology um, and in pediatrics, in adult both, and interventional. And there will be hybrid physicians, but um, that's something very, very important. And it, this, and the, for the junior doctors who attended this meeting, maybe some of this <laughs> went over your head, but the whole purpose of listening to this talk is that to look at how big the world is. Stacy just gave a little bit of our idea about this big field. And we have doctors like Brigida Nurunathar Fatima plus Naruma Haider and others in Bangladesh working in this field. And I would encourage the younger physicians to explore this field and to join and get the satisfaction of taking care of this wonderful group of patients. And this patient, the, the thing about pediatric patient is this, the Stacy and Fatima can tell it better, Naruma, that I had some patients who I did ablation when I was in Georgia because there was no pediatric cardiology and they are 12 or 14 and they get attached to you. I mean, they become like your family and they come back to you even when they're adult. They don't leave you. I had patients who I had to give away. They wouldn't leave me and they would come back with other problems and that gives you the satisfaction of the job. So pediatric cardiology, pediatrics, please, the junior doctors, I would like you to think about this field and, and really focus. And the future is, is in front of you and it's a big, big field. Thank you. Can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we have a patient just operated. Uh, he's now uh, still in our ICU. It is uh, Epstein anomaly, age is uh, one and a half year. And uh, this is, uh, we have done single ventricular stage repair because it is carpenter type four. So RV is very small. And the surgeon has done BD Glenn along with tricuspid valve sternness operation. That means he put a patch between RA and RV in the true annulus region and keep a fenestration to uh, take the blood from RA to RV or RV to RA. This is a bidirectional. And what happened after the operation in first uh, post-operative day, patient developed AVRT. And we uh, overdrive. And after the overdriving, patient came to sinus rhythm. And uh, nothing has happened hemodynamically stable. And on the 10th or 12th post-operative day, the same thing happened. Patient is hemodynamically stable and extubated. But again, we overdrive. And again, it becomes sinus rhythm and after, uh, before it is AVRT. And today it again happened, AVRT. So uh, what can we do now? And again, overdriving, it came back to sinus rhythm. So 50% of uh, Epstein's patients will have a Wolf-Parkinson-White accessory pathway. So I, I personally, at least for the adult patients, it's obviously different in kids, I don't let any patient have uh, surgery without an EP study first, because especially if they end up putting a ring in, you can't get back under that ring to do any any type of ablation. He's only and one those, and a half years. He's yeah, one. so at one and a half years, it's harder. Um, but at the same time, uh, the Wolf-Parkinson-White pathway is there 50% of the time, and often in the periop period, it becomes a problem. So I, I think, you know, at this point, you're going to have to use antiarrhythmic therapy dependent, you know, um, directed at the, uh, at the AVRT pathway. Um, and I think you're going to have to leave that on board for a long time. You know, I don't think you want to start and stop it and just get control or cardiovert once it's a pathway that's there that under this type of stress is going to come out and it may even want to be the predominant pathway. Um, and if there is the availability of EP study to get through the fenestration while you have a fenestration, um, because they can close on their own, uh, it, it may be worth going ahead and seeing if you can get an EP study in the one and a half year old to try to ablate the pathway. But those are very problematic pathways. And again, whenever possible, I highly recommend EP study before the surgery for, for that anatomy. Can we add now flicanide or some, because now we cannot do the EP study or uh, 
as because it is coming frequently? Well, you can because um, you're fenestrated. We just keep BD gland and there is a, a starness separation in between RA and RV, there is a patch. This is trike, one type of tricuspid valve repair. Oh, okay. It was there. So you can't get under there. Yes. Yeah, so you may wanna, you may wanna, uh, you know, come up with your best anti directed antiarrhythmic therapy. Um, okay, thank you. Professor, do you have any uh, suggestion regarding that? What's well, I mean, uh, be... I, I looked up the antiarrhythmic. First of all, I mean, which medicine to use is very tough in those groups. Um, Fleck and I, with structural heart disease, we have to be careful, but it, it, there is a good study on Fleck and I. The good thing about Fleck and I, it has no long-term side effects. Uh, if you think about drugs like amiodarone, you will destroy a lot of organs in the body. So that's, and also Fleck and I is available in Bangladesh. Uh, yeah, the other I have drug, one on flaconide, one on sotalol. Yeah, the other drug is sotalol. The, the problem with sotalol that it will also lower the blood pressure. That's the problem part. Flaconide doesn't do any of those. I mean, there is a warning of flaconide with structural heart disease, but I think it's a little bit, if you have no other choice and if you do it carefully monitored, you will be fine probably. And keeping the dose at the lower end, what I do is try to go for the lowest possible dose. Like in adults, you can go as low as 25 milligrams of BID. Of course, pediatric, I'm sure there will be equivalent dose. And for the adult, the maximum dose is 200 milligrams of BID. Uh, so you have a wide range. But the, in pediatric group, the problem is the therapeutic window is very narrow. So that is the problem in children, that the therapeutic window is so narrow. But the good thing about children is like, if you start at a low dose, they only grow bigger. So that's, uh, the, the chance of side effect will be minimized because they are, uh, the body weight is going up. So I think flaconide is a fairly good drug uh, in, in selected patients to buy some time. And I had a discussion with Naharoma about the case. The problem with ablation is that once you develop, create a lesion and they looked at it, that in, in pigs, they, if they put a dot of radio frequency current, which creates a lesion of one millimeter. When that pig grows adult, um, which will almost human size heart, that scar is one centimeter. So uh, it's not that it cannot be done, but uh, better be avoided. But I think it is time to think about developing pediatric EP in Bangladesh. And the way to do it will be that pediatric cardiologists know how to manipulate the catheters. And you have a navigator of an adult cardiologist. And that's how you develop the team. So I did it. I mean, I did, I worked with pediatric cardiologist in Georgia. I will not touch the catheter, but I knew exactly what to do. It's just that I don't know how to manage. So you, you, and that's how we develop the knowledge. And once they, and what will happen if adult cardiologist like Moshi and Atahar and uh, they participate in this process, what they can do, they can then train a group of pediatric. And, and that's the time they donate for the country, for the community, for the patients. And I think that's a big satisfaction in that. And I think, I hope that they will do that. And, and you can make a collaboration with, with our beautiful young generation pediatric cardiology, develop pediatric EP. Uh, that would be a wonderful thing to do. Thank and you. I think from here we can, I can work with Stacy also. I can give you connections here, the pediatric EP groups here. Uh, and they will be happy yeah, to collaborate. Our, our, yeah, our pediatric EP is Dr. Sudhir Vashis, and he's he's really lovely. Like he would be very happy to help. Thank you, sir. Dr. Arun, do, Professor Arun, do you want to make a comment? Uh, Arun, unmute, please. Professor Arun is actually from Nepal. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, Stacy. I'm enjoying your talk and enjoy. All this is easy and wonderful lectures. Thank you, Rafik sir and Wadud Atar. It's good lectures. In fact, uh, we have a lot of uh, students from Nepal. I think 14 or 15, I was counting, they're joining. And they find this uh, is easy session very helpful. It's not for me, it's for those new generation, as Rafik sir was saying. Some of these uh, young residents will pick it up and they will develop. Thank you. It's a good lecture. Thank you. Thank you.
But do I think I can wrap up? Yes, sir. Atar bhai, do you want to wrap it up? No, Atar is, um, I have to leave. Atar bhai, can you? Atar, uh, I have to leave. If you could wrap it up, please. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Stacy. We really enjoyed what could be done and what could be the future problem because we are started doing these procedures nowadays. So we'll be seeing these patients in future with complications and we have to be ready, at least mentally, uh, what to do about them, how to guide them to proper treatment. These lectures and your lecture is a beautiful one, will help us to get uh, ready for that. And the youngsters who are listening, as Rafik Sar was saying, hopefully some of them will pick it on and they'll uh, develop themselves into a specialist who will be dealing specifically with adult congenital heart disease. Today's lecture actually uh, is going to be a beacon uh, for the adult cardiologist, for the pediatric cardiologist to think about what we are lacking and what we should be doing in future. Hopefully, we'll be seeing more of you and we'll be learning more from you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, the panelists. And uh, thank you, Beximco Pharma, for helping with us for last one year. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Enjoy your skiing. <laughs> Stacy, you have an international forum because uh, in our session, actually, Arun Musk is actually one of our uh, 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 colleagues and he graduated, he does his MD from our institute. And many of his students are actually always join in the session. So uh, you have a, some students from uh, Nepal, from Bangladesh, and some of them maybe from India as well. So you have international forum in this. Sir, we have, this is uh, wonderful. Interestingly, sir, we have many participants over Facebook from Middle East and Africa also. Yeah, Middle East and Maldives. Yeah, and Africa, sir. There are some uh, participants from Libya and some African countries also. Interesting, very interesting. So Did this online I can, see, I can see Professor Salam. Salam, hi. I think he's uh, muted. Okay. Yes. All right. So I think we should close the session, right? Yes, and there is a, another a short video, sir. The next week we'll have some lectures on clinical, ECG in clinical uh, practice, which will be provided by Dr. Abu Muhammad Shafi from United Hospitals. Good. And we and uh, we're eagerly waiting for the next session. And again, I thank you and congratulate Dr. Stacey Fisher to be with us. As the officer said, she showed us a new uh, road, a new way of thinking in pediatric cardiology and also that of congenital heart disease. Thank you, madam. Thank you all the participants for attending this uh, nice presentation. Thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Everyone, as-salamu alaykum.